Welcome back for another preview video. This time I'm very excited because I have the opportunity to present to you a brand new civilization game from Ice Makes, a game that uh, comes with uh, really, really interesting choices, design and game flow. It's a game about civilization, as I said, it's a 4X game, but the difference is that it's a game which has very, very robust, straightforward and accessible rules. Uh, don't uh, think that this is uh, uh, an easy game, okay? It's an easy to, to get behind and understand, but it's a game which has a lot of depth, a lot of strategy and a lot of options. But above all, it manages with uh, the fast gameplay and with the very clever designing ideas to keep everybody uh, involved, everybody into the game and make every decision matter. It's a game that uh, really involves about a very, very simple selection of either making uh, two uh, actions during your turn or making an action and invent something. It's very easy to put inventions out and they're going to shape your civilization accordingly. They're going to give you boosts, abilities, uh, bonuses and really make you very, very different from other players together with the civilization that you have uh, chosen from the beginning of uh, the game, either Greeks, uh, English, French, uh, Chinese and so on. You're going to have also special abilities and this is going to really help you uh, forge a very, very different civilization and game style for you specifically. The game flow is really, really nice. I'm going to add a bit more about my impressions at the end of this video, as I do typically, where I present my final thoughts and impressions of the game. But uh, just to get you into the overall uh, design idea, this is a game that uh, uh, really uh, sits very, very elegantly, I would say, behind the game design uh, framework. I really enjoyed uh, that uh, you play three epochs. So you start from uh, the ancient times, then you go to medieval, and then you move to the modern. So you will be uh, using uh, military units and inventions from, I don't know, the old ages all the way until, the, you know, the in, you'll invent, invent the internet and invent uh, the, uh, uh, the, the the flying uh, I don't know, aircraft and the satellites and so on. But uh, you start from the basics, as always. Uh, it gives you a very, very good impression of you taking your civilization and shaping it through the course of the years from era to, from epoch to epoch, from epoch one, where you have six turns, to epoch two, you have another six turns. And finally, with epoch three, where you have the final uh, six turns each player is having a total of 18 turns and um, uh, by that time you're going to calculate your score I have to admit that uh, the game really just fell into sp into uh, place I mean everything uh, seemed logical to me everything was uh, what I would have wanted it in to be in terms of design and uh, above all uh, the game really presents a lot of choices, so you can go and be a warmonger and do a lot of war, you can go and invent a lot of things, you can do expand and exploit and you can do exterminate or you can do explore. So all these things which typically you see in very heavy, difficult uh, games with uh, endless rules, with a lot of details, with conditions, with, 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 which are really nice. I love Civ games, uh, many of us do. I think here you get the same feeling, the same depth with things that fall into place easier. I don't know how if I'm describing it um, correctly, but everything seemed logical in terms of what I would expect in rules. But on the same time, the main thing that drives the game, uh, the action then, when you either make two actions, but no invention, or one action and one invention, uh, and shaping the, four, you know, the face and the possibilities of your civilization, this really dictates uh, the game flow and really makes each uh, session different. All the sessions of the game I played so far, they were completely different. Uh, you, you can try different things, you can go for different things. Each of them have their possibilities uh, to grow, their uh, you know, uh, opportunities to exploit, etc. And uh, I would say overall, this game manages to deliver very elegantly, uh, in a robust uh, way, the feeling of uh, heavy civilization games without being heavy but with, with, being, uh, uh, with having a lot of meat around the bone, we had a lot of options, a lot of strategy and a lot of things to explore. So I'm going to explain the rules of the game. I'm going to show you exactly how the game uh, works. I'm going to add timestamps in the description of the video so you can click directly and go to the components, to how to play, to the war section of the game, etc. and understand everything you want to see. And I'm going to come at the end of this video, as I always do, for a final wrap up and my final opinion about the game. I'm already loving it. I'm giving it up front. Uh, I'm enjoying this game a lot. It's going to be a civilization game that is going to get a lot of play, not from me only, from everybody. Everybody who loves Civ games, they should definitely check this one out. This is a very robust Civ game, which really, really works. So join me at the table and let's see how the game plays. In 
epoch's course of cultures, you will lead your civilization and plan your way to go to the crossroads of history across the three epochs. Be a pioneer to expand territories, be an innovator to foster study and research, or be a warmonger to raid using superior armaments. The choice is yours, and it is your strategic acumen that will shape the course of the cultures and lead your people towards victory. Within the game you will compete with other leaders to become the most prestigious civilization throughout three epochs, ancient, medieval and modern. You will introduce a total of nine inventions to customize your civilization and in your turn you can choose to expand your territories in the shared map, build cities, establish trade routes, do academic research, change the form of government and build magnificent wonders to consolidate your authority. But cruelty, being peaceful, is not always the best way to benefit your people. Leaders can choose to declare wars to others within an epoch. A wise leader may have to prepare for the wars by improving their military units. Immerse yourself in the reimagination of human history, where every decision carries weight and every action shapes the course of your civilization. Will you be remembered as benevolent ruler, revered for your cultural achievements, or will you carve a legacy through conquest, leaving a trail of triumph in your wake? The fate of your people rests in your hands, so be visionary leader and create a civilization that will stand in the test of epochs. Welcome to this preview video for Epochs Course of Cultures. Very excited for uh, showing you this uh, great civilization game which has ex exceptional gameplay and fantastic ideas. So let's get started right away. We'll go through uh, the components of the game, then explain the rules and how the game plays, and then come back for my final opinion and the final impressions from the sessions I have already from the game. So let's dive right away into the components and what the game comes uh, with. But as a reminder, uh, what you see in front of you uh, may look gorgeous and may look like a final production state of the game, but still it's a prototype, it's a glorious and fantastic and very beautiful looking prototype, still it's a prototype, uh, so everything you see uh, is very close to perfection in my opinion, just personal taste, but uh, there would be probably some kind of uh, fine tuning and arrangements uh, through the uh, crowdfunding campaign page, which will uh, start uh, right about now, and I'm going to add a link in the description of the video so you can follow up. So keep that in mind that this is a prototype. So, the first thing that we see in front of us is uh, the game board, which is this area over here. It uh, is consisted of different aspects, a uh, placeholder for cards, uh, different tracks for the culture track and the science track, but we're going to explain this through the course of the game for the moment, keep in mind that this is the main game board. Just beneath it we have uh, this uh, board, which is the military board, tracking the military uh, advantages for each of the players. See how this is done later on. And just below here, the blue board is the invention market board, where it's essentially a placeholder for invention cards, which we're going to explain later on. And uh, these inventions will uh, help you further customize your civilization because you're going to build nine through the course of the game. For the moment, we just place it here as you see. What I'm showing you is just a recommended setup. You can see that the boards can be uh, set as you see best fit based on your size, the surface you have and your playing area for your convenience. But this is uh, just a recommended uh, or proposed uh, setup, putting everything uh, beneath each other. Next to the right here, you see uh, already two decks on the board, which is um, called the drawing board. It has um, the, um, uh, the cards, the uh, Epoch uh, 1 to Epoch um, Epoch 1, Epoch 2 or Epoch 3 or 3 plus, later on we start with Epoch 1, uh, market cards and also we have the upcoming invention cards for the upcoming Epoch. Okay? The cards you see here are from uh, inventions from Epoch 1, more on that later during setup, uh, but as you can see I have already set up the game for 3 players. Then. Just over here I have collected the resources of the game, so you have green which stands for food, you have blue which stands for science, and you have uh, orange which stands for production, and then you have gold with these tokens, and there are their respective multipliers five times uh, if you're running low on any of those. We also have four warmonger uh, tokens, these tokens when you get once you declare a war to another player. Uh, we have the upcoming epoch market cards for Epoch 2, Epoch 3, and we also have the 3+. plus. We also have the upcoming, uh, the third Epoch uh, invention cards uh, set aside for the moment. And then we have uh, these nice cities. These are the neutral cities, uh, because uh, if you have them uh, colored in the player colors, this belongs to the player. If it's white, that means it's a neutral city. 
Further below here, you can see I have already set up the game for three players. This game plays from two to four players. Uh, if you play with four players, uh, the board is even um, the map region is even uh, larger. There is a variety of um, uh, hexes uh, waiting to be explored. Okay, you're going to flip them and reveal uh, different terrain, and you're going to add them uh, to the rest of the map based on the rules that I'm going to explain later on. But uh, for the moment, this is the area where uh, you have a total of 16 map tiles. You set it up uh, according to the number of players and then you also have a selection of uh, dice 12 combat dice you get additional dice ben, uh, depending on how many advantages you have based on the type of the terrain if you're defending etc etc more on that later and then we have the play raid one for each player a very nice may I add play raid which uh, depicts uh, uh, first of all what happens in your turn you have the upkeep step the action step and the military step what happens when the epoch ends and what happens during war very handy and very useful uh, next thing we have are the player boards. Each player, they're going to uh, make up their uh, playing area uh, accordingly. Uh, let me show you what I mean. So here at the bottom is the playing area uh, for one player. Okay, there are quite a few boards, but you know you can just set them next to each other, and it's really really convenient uh, to again place them uh, based on your surface area and uh, your playing area. But each player is going to get a selection of boards. Uh, the first board that you're going to have is uh, the trading board. We're going to analyze uh, what this means you know, during explaining the rules. But again, this is nice uh, board which uh, has the offer and demand. You have the resources. You have a reminder of the actions and what you do if you do any of those actions. Okay, and there are placeholders on top for uh, your army units and your wonders, respectively. Next to it, you're going to add another board which is the government board. So each player is going to have this setup for the moment before going to the right. In the government board, as you can see, you have on the top some additional slots for invention. So you're going to put cards on top of that. Then you have your government. You start with a cube here with the chiefdom, and then you can switch following the course of the arrows to different types of government, giving you different benefits, different amount of cities you can build and so on. Okay, this is also very nice and useful. Then, once you have those two boards next to each other, you're going to add here your um, uh, specific, unique uh, civilization board. The game, uh, at least the prototype, comes with six uh, civilization boards. Being Greek, I couldn't resist by taking the Greek, the Greek <laughs> civilization board. Uh, but you see, you have a variety of um, other civilizations like Egypt, China, France, England and Mongolia. Keep in mind I've done a very very detailed unboxing of the prototype so you can go there and have a closer look on all the components of the prototype. But for the moment keep in mind that this is the third piece of board you take uh, next to your playing area and you click it to the side it all makes a very nice uh, continued art as you can see and I have selected my uh, civilization board here. Last but not least every player is going to get a storage board which clicks also very nicely, as you can see, next to your civilization board, where on the top you're going to uh, store your uh, resources and on the bottom you're going to store the gold, more on that later. And here is the area with uh, the components that you have at the start of the game, uh, more on that uh, during the setup. But for the moment, let, let me show you what's what. These are the cities on the player color. We have cubes, which are the uh, cubes of the player. Uh, you'll see this icon as um, uh, a flag, yeah, this is the icon, this is the authority, uh, and you show it uh, to, to use it to show that you have control of various uh, regions and hexes. Uh, you have two out of uh, the eight total two for each player ability cubes, which once you uh, unlock one ability specific to your civilization, you indicate it by uh, moving those cubes there. These different shaped uh, tokens in the player color, in this case yellow, are the trading posts. You can establish trade routes with uh, your opponents to have advantages. And then you have these uh, yellow arrows, which uh, once you get, uh, you have the, um, an advantage, you just place it on the different terrain and you can have a selection of advantages here for a quick overview what advantages each player has and for each such advantage you're going to um, roll one more uh, die. Speaking of die, these are the combat dice that you see. We have the brown cubes over there, which are the barbarians. Okay, so you could be fighting barbarians uh, and trying to remove them uh, or uh, trying to fight neutral cities, as I've shown you before, the white cities. And the last thing that I want to show you, we have some additional tokens. We have these tokens, the Greek word, uh, word uh, of art. These are tokens that you collect 
and uh, based on the number you have you're going to score increasing increasingly more victory points and also you have some exploration tokens once you explore some areas you're going to uncover some bonuses that you can uh, reveal uh, now these are all the components of the game uh, I have to tell the, to tell you that the, the cards are amazing. The artwork on these cards are, is uh, absolutely stunning. Okay, uh, big variety of cards, different things, beautiful, beautiful illustrated, both from invention point of view, or from uh, armies point of view. You also start with one Axeman in your player color, but uh, you most probably want to upgrade this very, very soon. You can have one uh, foot um, or infantry or land unit, let's say, and one uh, uh, archer unit uh, ranged, okay? And you can keep upgrading those. Uh, here are the era one, the epoch one, you have archers and spearmen, but uh, you can gain more from the market like for example i have revealed already four cards from the market and based on if they are uh, army units they go on the left column and if they are wonders they go on the right and you'll be building also uh, beautiful um, wonders down the road so there you have it these are all the components of the game so let's start with the game setup first we make the setup for the common area we place the game board on the top of the table and we use the side for two players if it's applicable or the side for three to four players which is depicted over here then we place the scroll that i just touched the scroll token on the starting space of the research track this is the research track it's going to move upwards and so we place it here at the start once uh, we've done that we also place all the basic units uh, for epoch one on uh, the corresponding uh, spot for Epoch 1, so we have the uh, foot units, uh, or I should say the, um, I don't know, the, the melee units with this icon, and then the ranged units with this icon. So you can see that these belong to range uh, to era 1, okay? Uh, then we're going to have era 2, so we separate all, only the ones for era 1, place them on the corresponding uh, Epoch uh, placeholder those for range ones and those for melee ones okay of uh, the epoch that we are planning we're starting with uh, epoch one once we've done that then we uh, place the military board and invention market board right below this is the military board this is the invention board for uh, keeping hold of uh, the invention cards and here is the drawing board that we place beneath of course you can place them somewhere else depending on your surface area and your table you're playing with we take the market cards which have the first epoch so those we shuffle them and we place them on the drawing board on this spot here from there we feed the uh, main board with four cards to begin with so we draw four cards and if the card is a wonder like this one it has a green background and you can see this is for example colossus uh, they would go on this right column okay from top from bottom to top they're going to move there okay so until they find the top uh, most empty space if we draw a military unit they will go on the left column which is the military unit one this is the uh, wonders column and this is a military units and they will still populate the topmost uh, empty space in the column we do that by revealing four cards and placing them on the corresponding column based if, if it's a military unit or a wonder then we will take and shuffle the uh, epoch 2 uh, deck for the inventions and place it here we're also going to take the um, Epoch 1 uh, deck, uh, this one, okay, with the inventions of Epoch 1, uh, shuffle it, and once we shuffle it, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, four cards and place them on these four spots on the invention board, right? And after that, we're going to shuffle it to um, pass away six, six invention cards to each player around the board for their starting hand. We're not going to need the rest of the uh, Epoch 1 uh, invention cards, we're going to remove them and put them back into the box. Then we're going to place nearby the uh, market cards for uh, Epoch 2, Epoch 3 and the ones with uh, 3 plus, as well as the uh, invention uh, blue deck with inventions from Epoch 3. 
ready to be used later on. We'll place the rest of the components nearby, like the resources, the warm gear tokens, the five multipliers, as well as any other uh, components like the dice, the barbarian cubes, uh, the works of art and the bonuses. Then we're going to set up the map of uh, the game. We're going to shuffle the map tiles. These are the map tiles. They have different map terrain, as you can see. Shuffle it face down and we're going to randomly place 9, 12 or 16 face down for a 2, 3 or 4 player. Uh, the rulebook shows the diagram when you have two players, three players or four players and you're going to reveal one, two or four uh, tiles in the middle of the playing area respectively. So for uh, four, uh, three players that I'm uh, showing you now, I'm revealing two tiles, the ones in the middle and the rest around the revealed ones stay face down for the players to explore them. Then we connect the terrain uh, tiles because when we reveal them, uh, we need to decide the orientation of which we place them next to each other. And the same goes for revealing more uh, terrain tiles, map tiles down the road as you explore. So uh, during setup already, when we reveal them, we need to see the way that we orientate them, rotate them I should say, so that uh, they're placed next to each other. And in order to do so, to do so we go and check the priority uh, on the military board. So as you can see here, the priority of the terrain is the following, uh, starting from the water, going all the way to the mountain tile. So um, you need to check uh, the terrain. So you connect the terrains in common with the priority according to this uh, area. You check C terrain first, okay? If both tiles have it, you need to make the two C terrain uh, hexes touch each other. If C is not common uh, in those two revealed, then you go and uh, check the next one and the next one and the next one until you go all the way down. Uh, so you place them uh, there with the correct orientation. In this case, I revealed this one first and when I revealed this one, I, could, I should decide if the C needs to be from that side or that side, respectively. Uh, I didn't have any C on the other uh, map tile, so I'm moving to the next one and next to the C, the ones that you have is uh, the, the field. So uh, if I was placing it the other way around, the mountain is going to be touching here and no planes are going to be touching to each other, but the planes are coming second in priority, so I orientate it like that, therefore this is how uh, the placement would be done. In any case, you hold the priority as shown on the military board. Once you've done that, you go and you place tokens or wooden parts on the indicated spaces. Meaning, here we've seen a, a barbarian... Uh, let me focus. You see a barbarian uh, icon, so you need to place a barbarian cube. Uh, here I don't need to place anything, this is printed. Here I see a neutral city, so I need to take a neutral city and place it on the intersection of the three hexes. And here uh, I can see that I also need to place uh, one a bonus uh, token, one exploration token with a question mark. So I take one face down and place it on the corresponding spot. So in any case, you need to populate the revealed hexes, map hexes, with anything uh, printed on them accordingly. Then we proceed with the player area setup. First of all, uh, we deal two civilization boards to each player, okay? So they can uh, select uh, between two which ones they want, unless you have a Greek <laughs> a player uh, in the group like me who always wants to play Greece. But no matter what, uh, if you're playing with less than four players, you deal two to each player and they select one and uh, discard the other one. If you're playing with uh, four players, you just keep that and uh, each player is just simultaneously picking one to use in the game. You take it and you place it in front of you. Now, uh, as you can see, I have the play area of my of a player, of myself here, uh, already set up. Uh, but keep in mind that you're not going to have anything above your play area. I just have squeezed everything so that I can fit it in my uh, in my ratio for my recording purposes. But you know, you're going to have spaces above your boards for placing cards. Okay, so it's not going to be stuck everything together. So keep that in mind. Now, uh, you set up your play area by combining the trading board, which is this one, with the government board, which is this one, with your civilization selected, which is this one, and then you place the storage board and all of those four pieces, one, two, three, four, make your playing area. Uh, you place the unit Axeman on the right side above your trading board. So this one is your, uh, let me focus, this is 
the military unit that each player starts with, the Axeman. You have your color, I'm a yellow player, so that's why you see yellow uh, uh, colors uh, for, uh, for this unit. So I take it and I place it. Just here you have a sword, forget about what you see, maybe I should take it out for not confusing anyone. Okay. So you place uh, your uh, Axeman, your starting unit there, okay? Uh, you're going to be able to have two units, okay? A, a melee and a ranged one, uh, and they're going to be one on top of the other, uh, on this column, above your trading board. Here you're going to store your wonders. Here you're going to have slots for your inventions, okay? But this is how uh, you're going to start the game. Then you're going to take and place five honor tokens on the assigned area of the government board. These tokens are here. Uh, these are claimed by the players when they uh, win a battle uh, over you. Okay, so you take them and you place them here. The next thing that you do is uh, you place the play rate of the civilization that you're playing above, uh, or the play rate above your civilization. So you're going to have it around here or next to you for any convenient space. Uh, then you're going to place one city, four. Uh, player cubes, the authority as they're called, for trading posts in this area over here. And keep in mind that uh, to you it's only available what you have here. The rest of the cubes that you may have somewhere else next to you, okay, uh, or the rest of the cities you haven't placed here, they are not available for you to place, okay? So you need to gain them first, and then once you have them here on this area on your civilization board, then you're allowed to place them, okay? So for example, here at the moment I only have four cubes. If I need to place a fifth one and I don't have one, then tough luck for me. I should have made plans so that I would have acquired more authority cubes and place them here. Then I uh, set aside the 10 advantage tokens in my player color. Uh, this is a yellow one for the player. Okay, so I set them aside here. I will have them next to me, I'm matching my player color, a yellow for yellow player. These are going to be placed on the military board to indicate advantages during battle. More on that later. You also have your uh, 30 plus uh, point token, you take it and you place it on your uh, uh, board if you're matching more than 30 points. You take all the remaining uh, cubes, place them nearby, outside of this area, not to confuse them, so you are not allowed to pick up from the cubes if they are not here. The same goes for the cities. Uh, and then uh, you take and you place the basic resources, uh, one of each, food, production and science, you see them here on the pre-printed corresponding spots on the top of the um, storage board. Okay, the bottom one is for gold, but you start with no gold uh, the game with. Once you've done that, you also place two ability cubes to the side on the corresponding slots. These are available for upgrading and getting the specific uh, attributes for your civilization uh, once you unlock them. Okay, and then uh, you have everything needed everything to your possession and uh, you also take and you place nearby this token uh, which is uh, to indicate that you have one more strength in combat one if you have matching uh, military units matching their formation more on that later for the moment you just have it to the side and lastly you place one player cube on the first space of the military board so let's squeeze again everything back in you take and you place uh, one cube here on the first uh, spot of the military board. This goes around here, okay? And then you also place one cube on the zero space of the cultural track, which is this one, the purple one, and goes around the science uh, track, okay? This is called the purple one, the circular one uh, on the main board. It's called uh, cultural uh, board, and this is placed there too. So, after completing the setup, let's move to the objective. As the leader of a civilization, you will try to have the most victory points to become the most prestige leader throughout three epochs. The game rundown. Epochs, course of culture, is played over three epochs, representing three periods, the ancient, the medieval and the modern, of the human history. As the leader of a civilization, on the total of 18 turns in the game, you will, introducing, you will be introducing inventions to customize your civilization, explore the undiscovered regions, expand your territories in the shared map, build cities, build trading posts, do academic research, change the form of government, and build magnificent wonders to consolidate your authority. But cruelly, being peacefully, 
is not always the best way to benefit your people. You may have to, involve, uh, to be involved in armed conflicts with other nations, and a wise leader may have to prepare for the wars coming ahead by improving and upgrading their military units. So, three epochs, and the main uh, flow of each epoch is uh, upkeep step, action step, and military step, for each of your six turns in an epoch but the main flow of the epoch is first of all you have the setup of epoch one which already done for starting the game then we have it six turns for each player so i play one turn the next player clockwise plays a turn and so on going uh, clockwise until each player had an opportunity to play six turns and then we have the end of epoch one Subsequently, we make some preparations for moving to uh, Epoch 2, so we have the setup of Epoch 2, again 6 turns for each player for Epoch 2 and end of Epoch 2. And last we go to the setup of Epoch 3, 6 turns for each player again and end of Epoch 3. And then we have the end of the game and the final scoring. So in your turn, you randomly choose a first player, starting from the first player each player takes a turn in a clockwise order and we repeat this until the player has gone through 6 turns. In your turn, you go through three steps. So when it's your turn in an epoch, you go through uh, these steps and you're going to do that six times whenever your turn is it's in each of the six turns uh, that you will take in an epoch. So when your turn it is, you have first the upkeep step, then the action step and then the military step. And once you've done those three steps, we move with the turn of the next player and the next player until it's back to your turn and each player will take six turns in this format. So let's see the upkeep step. So during the upkeep step you will draw one invention of the next epoch, meaning if we're playing uh, in epoch 1, you will draw one from the epoch 2 deck into your hand. Uh, you will reveal one market card or two if we're playing a two-player game. You will explore one map tile if there are map tiles still unexplored, otherwise you're going to skip this one. And then you're going to remove maintenance costs on your units. So let's see that in practice. Remember we have a hand of six uh, invention cards belonging from Epoch 1 when we started the game. Okay, so this is the hand of each player. So when it's my turn during the upkeep step, I will draw one invention card from the next Epoch uh, deck. So. I'm playing Epoch 1, but I'm drawing one from the Epoch 2. Uh, and then, since I have this one in my hand, then uh, I will have one uh, more uh, invention, but this time with uh, theoretically higher uh, capabilities because it's going to come from the next Epoch deck. Then, I'm going to deal one card or two cards if I'm playing a two-player game into the market. So I'm going to take one card from the drawing board and depending if it is a unit it's going to go into the unit slot, right? Or if it was a wonder it is going to go into the wonder slot. But let's assume that uh, we have already some more cards here. Okay, this is a wonder. Only one card I'm drawing at this step during my upkeep turn. Okay, and let's say that, not, that now, if it was my turn, I would draw a card and let's say I drew this card, this is a military card, okay, so I need to place it and deal it into the market. This is going to go and push all the cards, okay, until it goes into the area. So by pushing, it's going to push all the cards, the one on the top is going to be removed and it's going to be on the discard, so out of the market area and it's going to be inserted from the bottom okay so this is how you feed cards into the market respectively there is an area for discard which is on top above the uh, main board but for me there is the end of my playing area so I'm just going to remove it for the moment out of the picture as a main concept if a card is acquired from the market and there is a spot all the cards beneath it they will move upwards to fill in the space okay so they're always going to go towards uh, the top of uh, the board okay cool next we're going to reveal a face down map tile i'm going to skip this if all the map tiles have already been revealed just like in setup we're going to place the corresponding tokens or wooden parts on the indicated spaces and for these map tiles there must be either a horse or iron and we make it into consideration if we need those resources so uh let's say that we <coughs> reveal one of the tiles okay 
then uh, we have to decide the way that we are going to orientate it in order to rotate it I should say in order to place it following the rules same rules like with setup in this case it has no uh, effect okay uh, but uh, actually it has an effect if there was uh, any since there is a mountain area it has to be next to the mountain area so these two need to be like that okay and of course the barbarian cube is going to be placed here and here we have uh, as you can see uh, one uh, strategic resource in this case uh, iron but the rule is the same like with setup uh, you leave your newly revealed map tile on the original direction or rotate it by 180 degrees in order to connect the higher priority terrain with the same type of terrain on an adjacent map tile if the higher priority terrain can be connected in either way you can choose your preferred uh, direction lastly you remove maintenance costs on your units if you have any maintenance costs on your units you remove them and the maintenance costs uh, can only last for one round the details of this will be more uh, make more sense once the military rules are going to be explained later on once we've done that the player still in their turn they move into their action step where they can do one of the two they can either invent and perform one action or they can perform two actions but no invent let's see those two in more detail okay So, invent and perform an action. You play a current Epoch Invention card from your hand or mark it as an invention. You cannot play the same invention twice in the game. Okay? So, let's say I want to invent philosophy. Okay? I'm going to play it. I'm going to explain later how, uh, what happens when we invent, how exactly are played. But keep in mind that here on this area that I showed you just now, you may have uh, inventions. Okay? A lot of inventions. And once you have more inventions, you just need to have them overlapping like that. So the text box only is visible uh, below with the invention. Okay. So uh, if you choose uh, an invention card from the market, you need to replace it with one card from your hand first, and then take it into your hand and place that card onto your invention on, onto your inventions area. Uh, and then you perform one action. So either I, I invent and I perform one action, one of the actions later, or I perform two actions, but I cannot invent. If I perform two actions, I place a current epoch invention card to cover an invention card on the market, and then I perform two actions. Keep in mind that you must invent three inventions in an epoch. That means you cannot invent less inventions just to have more actions. Okay? You just need to time them according to your plans key concept when you invent when you play invention card as an invention you get the debut reward on the top left of the corner of the card that means uh, when I'm going to play this invention here it gives me a reward which is over here in this case I'm going to gain one food a new invention would always give impact to the world the player on your left also gets the debut reward that means the player on my left will also get one food because that was the reward then you own the abilities on the invention now let's see a key concept about resources as you see resources are placed here on your resource board which is on the right of your civilization when you gain resources either food science or production or even gold you take them from the pile the common piles and store them on your storage board for the basic resources, these are the three basic resources, food, science and production, they are placed on the upper part of your storage board, while gold is stored on the lower part here. There is a printout uh, that uh, also indicates that, so you don't have to remember it on top of your head, but it makes pretty sense that gold is stored on the bottom and the basic resources on the top. If there is a lack of tokens, uh, you try to use the five times multiplier uh, tokens uh, to indicate that you have five. For example, if I needed to have five gold, I would place one multiplier if I'm running low on gold tokens. So this is where you store your resources. Another key concept is when uh, on the personal supply and when gaining authority. Authority are those cubes here once they are gained over here in this area. During setup, each player has set aside some wooden parts and tokens to form personal supply. During the game, unless you gain them, otherwise you cannot take the components uh, there and place them here for you to use. 
Whenever you need to use any city, player cube or trading post, you can only access those that they are already on your civilization board, not any to the side, which are your supply. Whenever you gain authority, which is marked by a hill with flags on it, a grey hill with flags, this means that uh, you're taking one player cube from your personal supply and adding it here, so you have authority. Now you have five authority cubes there. Uh, keep in mind that you can only have 24 authority cubes in maximum, and if you're running out of player cubes, you will not gain any more authority cubes. To access more cities, you need to change your government form, but, but it will be explained later on. So that means for the moment I can only have one city, because my government at the moment is chiefdom, because my cube is here, and that allows me to have only one city. But if later on I move to a different type of government, I will be able to have access to more cities to build, to build on the map. Another key concept is um, the uh, gaining culture concept, which is this icon here with uh, uh, this symbol in the pink. You advance your cube on the culture track, which goes around, as you see, when you gain an amount of culture. So if I'm the yellow and I gain two culture, I'm going to move my cube one, two, to indicate that I have gained two culture. You must position your cube behind your rival's cube if they have arrived the same space before you. And whenever you need to compare who is higher, the player with the cube on the front is a winner. For example, uh, if the red player gains two culture and they are here, the yellow is considered to be ahead because they arrived there earlier. There is a token with 30 plus, but you can use it once you've done a full circle and you need to add more culture to what you have already uh, acquired. Now let's see the actions in detail. In the action step, as we mentioned, you can perform any of the following actions by your choice. However, for your first action in the game, you must choose to expand in order to locate the place of origin for your nation. Now the actions are uh, summarized here uh, below your trading board. Okay, and these are the actions that you can take. But this is the first one that you need to do in the game uh, because you need to uh, insert yourself on the map. This is called expand. And here you see the cost for the action. It has a cost of one food. In order to expand, you need to have a cost of one food. You may move a player cube from your civilization board, meaning it is an authority you already have on your civilization board, to a hexagon to occupy it as your land that defines the territories of your civilization. You will need to fulfill all of the following conditions in order to do so. The target hexagon touches one of your lands, cities or trading posts. The target hexagon is not a land owned by any of your rivals. The target hexagon does not contain any barbarians. You need to fight them in order to gain the, uh, the area there. And last but not least, the target hexagon is not a C hex. In the base game, a C cannot be occupied by any circumstances. Just for the first time, uh, when you do the expand action, you do not have to land uh, from the beginning of the game. In your first expand action, you ignore the condition 1, meaning there is no uh, other hexes with any of your cubes or your lands or your cities because you're just entering the game. So you can place one of your cubes on any hexagon as your starting land. However, you still need to fulfill the rest of the conditions. They not need to be on a sea, not owned by any of your rivals and not owned by any barbarians. If it is the first game, it's recommended uh, that you place your uh, first land somewhere away from your rivals, not close to them, in order to try to grow first and then try to attack them. So just to demonstrate again, I'm taking one uh, authority cube from the civilization board. I can place it on, uh, because it's my first expand action, I can place it anywhere I want, but not on a, a hex where another player has any of their uh, pieces, like this one or that one, nor a hex where there's a barbarian. So let's say I'm placing it here. Again, remember, for me to make the expand, I need to pay one foot. That's why I start with one foot in the game, so I need to spend this one in order to make the expand. And every time I want to expand, I need to, play, uh, to pay one foot from my storage board. Now, some key concept about natural resources on the map. There may be a natural resource on a hexagon, and when you expand your land to the hexagon containing them, you own that kind of natural resource. Each symbol with this one, which has a, like a golden ring, provides you with two supply. 
That means if you occupy this one, okay, so let's say I start the game and I place it here, uh, then I'm going to get to supply. Practically, I'm going to update my supply to indicate that I have two at the moment. This is on top of the supply track and below it's the demand track okay by owning that hexagon i immediately gained two as a yellow player uh, supply because i owned that specific uh, special natural resource each uh, horse iron or minor luxury this is major luxury because it's gold it's minor lu luxury which is silver provides you with one uh, supply okay but each uh, major uh, luxury like this one or that one provides you to supply whenever you acquire uh, more supply by owning hexes with those natural resources you update your trading uh, um, your uh, supply track respectively we'll explain trading income further on keep in mind that strategic resources like horses or iron are very important for upgrading your military units so keep that in mind also or for example, if I was, it was my turn now and I was going to play here, I would gain one supply and I would gain access to horses also. And I can do that and I need to spend, of course, one foot in order to, to be able to expand, okay? And following the normal rules of the game. Another key concept is unknown resources. So when you see this token on the map, this one here, uh, that means that it's an unknown resource for you to explore. You can expand into hexagon with such an unknown resource and when you do, you flip it over. If it is um, uh, a minor luxury, you leave it on the hexagon. If it is a gold or two food, then you take the resource bonus and discard it. In this case, if I was going, if the red was going to expand here, they were going to place their cube, pay it one food, uh, flip the token and they would reveal in this case one gold, so they would claim it and take it out of the uh, board and claim one gold and put it on the storage board. Now, back to the overall actions, we explored how you do expand, which is this action here. Now let's see how you do the build a city, which is this action over here. Yeah, in order to build a city, you have to pay a cost of three production, meaning three orange tokens from your storage board. Uh, you may build a city to provide a stable place for your people to live in, and a city is useful in many circumstances during the game. First of all, it provides uh, uh, demand, okay, so you're going to increase your demand. Uh, second of all, it provides four victory points at the end of the game, and in order to build a city, you need to select an intercept point of hexagons that is surrounded by your land. In this case here, this intercept is surrounded by my land, so I would pay three production and I would be able to place one city. Keep in mind, you need to have the city available to you from your civilization board. You cannot take it from your supply, like I explained before. However, if there is already a city in any adjacent intercept point, you cannot build there. Meaning that if that red city, for example, okay, uh, it was here, okay, you need to be also available, uh, legitimate to be able to put it, but let's say they had the one city there. I'm not able to place a city uh, directly there. They need to have at least two sides of a hex um, away from each other, okay? So keep that in mind also. You can also build a city that touches the sea. And uh, a sea cannot be occupied, so you only need to occupy the other two hexagons in order to build a city. So for example, uh, you can also build a city here. It's two away from another city. As long as you have ownership of this one and that one hex, then the yellow would be able to place a city over there. You cannot build a city though at the edge of the entire map. Next action is this one, to build a trading post. This is a trading post, remember? You need to have it available on your civilization board. The cost could be one or two production tokens. You may build a trading post in a city owned by others via a land route or a sea route. And each trading post provides um, supply and also, sorry, demand, and also a new starting point of expanding your territories. So you can have up to four trading posts on the map at the, end the same time. To do so, you need to select a starting point and a target city. The starting point must be a hexagon containing either a cube, city, or trading post of yours, and the target city where you want to build your trading post must be, uh, uh, the target city must belong to a non-warmonger player or neutral, have no any trading, no other uh, trading post owned by you, so you cannot have two trading posts in a city of another uh, player, have at least, uh, have less than two trading posts, okay, 
so uh, that's also a requirement and be reachable from your starting point a city is reachable within one or two hexagon range without crossing uh, a crossing C in the way to trade with the city it is a land trading route then it costs one production or if it's a city reachable with uh, unlimited range across C and to trade with the city the trading route costs two uh, production resources so for example yellow can build uh, as long as he has a requirement, a trending post next to this red city. Okay, it is within two ra hex ranges from one of his pieces, in this case uh, uh, from this or uh, yellow cube. Okay, and uh, he has to pay one production token. Uh, they have unlimited range across in a C, so it was a C hex is across, but they need to pay in that case two uh, production tokens. Key concept demand. And supply. This is the supply, this is the demand. And we have the two tracks on top of our trading board. When an epoch ends, you earn trade income that brings you gold and culture. We'll see how that goes later on. But keep in mind that the amount of your trade income is decided by the position of those markers. During the game, your demand and supply may change in many circumstances. You should always keep your markers updated on your trading board. For example, when you build a city, if it provides one uh, demand, so you will move it one like that. If uh, on another turn you lose a war, and that means you lose a land which contains a, a major luxury, that means you have to uh, lose two supply, so one, two, this will go to zero. So keep in mind that and keep in mind to keep it always updated. Next action is very simple, it's this one, it's called academic research. It costs an X amount of research uh, resources based on the research track. The research action can give you rewards on the research track instantly. You pay the required number of research tokens on the next row on the research track above the scroll and then you gain either the rewards on the left or the right of the next row and then you move the token scroll to cover them. You skip this if the research counter is above is about to reach the top space of course so let's see the research board in this case if i do research i have to pay one research resource and then i gain either three food or one culture let's say i want to gain three food i gain three food and i move the scroll up this is how research uh, works you take the track in the right uh, or the left the rewards and then you gain them and update accordingly what you have earned Next action is this one. You build a wonder, which costs an X amount of production based on the wonder card. As you can see, uh, a civilization sometimes needs to build wonders to show their mightness. A wonder may provide cultural points and authority cubes as rewards when built. Also, you will gain the unique abilities once you build them. You pay the amount of production uh, resources for the target wonder, as indicated uh, on the card, on the market and then you place it above the corresponding space of your trade board there is no limitation on how many wonders you may build also you do not need to have any land to build a wonder uh, it's only required to pay the amount of production sources for it in this case let's see the anatomy of this card okay it shows that it, it's a statue of zeus okay the cost is four production resources these are the rewards. I'm going to gain one culture point and two uh, authority cubes. And this is the uh, ability that I'm going to gain. The ability, of course, makes sense um, once I explain all the rules. But in this case, uh, yeah, uh, you just uh, uh, have a reward uh, linked with uh, the Warmonger token. Okay, this is a slot for your uh, wonders on the top. Uh, side as you can see and once as uh, you move uh, as you move into the game and you build more resort uh, more uh, wonders you have to follow the same step you just build them on top of each other okay no need for room or anything just to pay and you just need to have the ability visible okay and you can stack them uh, as you see in front of you next action is this one here this is the upgrade military unit and it costs research, of course, you have to make research in order to upgrade your military units. And the amount of research uh, resources you need to pay is based on the target unit card. War is cruel, only when the civilization with the strongest unit stands. Each player starts with uh, one Axeman, as you see here at the top, but uh, you may want to upgrade it rather soon because it's a very basic unit. 
When you upgrade your units, you pay the cost on the target unit card on the market and place the new one on the corresponding space. You can only have one main and one support. Cover the old current unit if you have an upgraded one. A unit provides you with only the combat value in war, but also all the abilities and advantages stated on the card. For the details of war we're going to explain them later on, but for the moment you cannot upgrade to a unit again if it's already upgraded in the same uh, game. So here you see I have an Axeman, this is uh, a main unit and this is a support unit, so I can have an Archer as a support unit. But uh, uh, when I upgrade a unit, I can uh, for example upgrade my Axeman uh, with the Epoch 1. Uh, next level which is the spearman okay and uh, i will always have a maximum of two units a main one and a support one and then i have the combined characteristics of advantages attack strength etc but more on that later on the combat okay and here is how you would upgrade your military by paying in this case if i'm going to upgrade uh, the amount of uh, research indicated on the target unit card The research uh, cost uh, can be affected by a few factors. When there is a strategic resource beside the cost, like in this case, there is a strategic resource beside. You have one research token and you need also horses. Uh, when there is a strategic resource beside your cost, you need to pay two extra research for each of them that you do not have in your land. So if I don't own a land with horses, like I've shown you before, I need to pay one research plus two for a total of three. If I own a land with horses, then I only need to pay one uh, research. A strategic resources of horses and iron only matters when you are doing the upgrade action. You do not need to pay extra research if you lost uh, the strategic, strategic resources uh, lands over the course of the game. When there are any territory icons beside the cost, could be that you also have territory icons beside the cost, like for example this slinger, I need to pay one research, plus I need to pay two extra resources if I do not own that kind of land. So if I own a mountain's hex, then I only pay one research. If I don't own a mountain's hex, I need to pay two plus one, a total of three. If you uh, have a current unit, when you pay the cost for upgrading, only pay the outstanding cost comparing with the print cost of the current unit. You take the case here, for example, uh, let's say, okay, it doesn't make sense, but anyway, if it was a, a current unit I had had the cost of one research and then I have to pay uh, three research because I own the horse, then I would pay three minus one, two research tokens in order to uh, build, uh, uh, upgrade the unit. So basically only the difference. Another key concept is uh, updating the military board. After upgrading your unit, you should update the information on the combat value track. You adjust the cube on the track to the space equal to the sum of your combat value for your units. And you put an advantage token on any advantages your units may have in combat. For example, uh, here in this case, you see that my strength is 2 plus 1 for a total of 3. That means a yellow player was going to move to uh, 2, 3, so they're going to be here. Okay, and the second thing that you need to do is uh, my uh, units have a slinger and a chariot have advantages for specific um, uh, things like uh, in this case uh, chariots have advantages for fields so I need to place an advantage here and so for grain and for fields so this and that they have advantages when I'm fighting on this type of terrain and also from the slingers I gain advantage when I'm finding, fighting on mountains you can also gain advantages when you're fighting in cities when you are fighting against uh, mounted uh, units in uh, uh, when you're the defender and so on so you're going to have a selection of those advantages indicating that in the combat uh, war you're going to roll one die plus one die for each of the advantages also you need to take the plus one combat which is uh, this one and you can gain it if you have the same formation you see that your units have a formation here icon if this formation matches the formation of the two units the support and the main then you gain a plus one okay and that's the total of your uh, strength for war Another action is the change of the form of government, which is this action over here. To change the form of government, you need to have already reached the required amount of culture track, a uh, culture from the culture track, based on uh, the form of government you want to change into. Uh, so, for example, in order to change from the starting uh, form of government, which is chiefdom, here, 
following uh, the arrows from chiefdom, you can either have a classical democracy, a monarchy, or a republic. Uh, you need to have the required amount of culture as indicated here. You need to have two culture. If you have less than two, you cannot switch uh, government. Then if you are already here, let's say you had monarchy and you want to go either uh, to any of the, the other uh, government forms, you need to have eight um, culture uh, acquired. Okay, so that's how it works. So, um, your form of government is very important because it dictates several things. First of all, you decide the maximum number of uh, cities you can have on uh, your possession, not on your supply. You start with only one, exactly because you have chiefdom, but later on in the game, if for example you have empire, you may have five uh, cities, or if you have communism, you may have six. But if you had libertarianism, you are uh, limited to four cities uh, as indicated on the government board. But again, don't forget the requirement for the culture uh, on the row of your form of government is a prerequisite for you to change into that form of government. So, let's see. For example, I'm uh, here, I started with chiefdom, and I want, uh, I'm taking the change of form of government action, so I can uh, switch my government. I have at least two uh, cultures, so I can move to any of those three. I'm deciding to follow the arrow, so I'm moving to classical democracy. Now I'm allowed to have two cities. Okay, then I immediately take the rewards as indicated on the top right side of uh, the board. In this case, I would gain two additional culture. Okay. Here you have the maximum number of cities uh, that you are allowed and here is the ability that you have linked with the form of the government you just have. Linked with uh, the maximum number of your cities, you should always check the total number of cities of your civilization board and the map. Uh, it should always match the maximum number of your cities. When the maximum number of your cities increases, you take the cities from your personal supply and you put it on your civilization board. Uh, in some rare cases, if the number of uh, decreases, you move the cities from the civilization back to the personal supply and you may even need to remove cities from the map if you do not have enough cities on the civilization board for this specific adjustment. In any case, you need to update accordingly. The last action you can select from uh, the ones available to you is the production command, which is this one over here. Sometimes you must uh, need some extra resources. You can perform this action and gain the resource states on your current form of government. That's why it's indicated here. So in this case, if I'm uh, performing this action, you can focus here and see for the classical democracy, I'm going to gain one research, respectively. But in all cases, you get what is uh, based on your current form of government. And uh, then uh, you will acquire this, uh, let's say, bonus from production command. And again, I remind you that this is the action uh, step of the turn of the player. So basically, again, either making uh, two actions, but no invention, or making one action and one invention. Okay, but you need to invent over the course of the whole epoch uh, three inventions, so you cannot take more actions. Now, once you've done, you finish your upkeep step, uh, for example, here, then you've finished with your action step here. Now you move to the military step. We're going to explain the military step and war, but keep in mind that for military you may spend maintenance cost to activate units, you may take the warmonger uh, uh, token and remove all related trading posts, and then you may attack one uh, target if your units are activated, and you may attack each rival if you took the warmonger this turn. Okay, and then we're going to have the free actions. So let's see the military step in uh, detail. So the military step has three um, uh, sub steps, let's say. The, first of all, the military uh, expenditure. There is a military expenditure for most of the units. You need to decide whether you put your resources on the units as the military expenditure in this step. If all your units' expenditure is fulfilled, your units will be counted as ready for war. You can advance or defend with your combat value and advantages. If they are not ready for war, they have zero attack strength and cannot attack. For example, in this case, you see that uh, the swordman has uh, one expenditure of one production uh, resource. So at this step, I need to decide if I'm adding uh, the, the cost here to indicate that this is ready. Okay? And if both of my units, the supply and the main, have expenditure, I need to cover for both of them, either none of them is ready to participate in the attack and offer their advantages and their combat strength. Okay? In this case, the slinger has no cost. Uh, but if it had uh, the top unit also a cost, I need to be able, I need to have them both covered. Otherwise, they don't contribute. 
Okay, so this is the first step and during the military expenditure this is a step where I decide uh, if I'm uh, putting the um, I'm placing the resources on the resource cards to indicate that they are participating in the combat and in the war to indicate actually they are ready uh, for war otherwise uh, they are not if they don't have the resources there the second step is the uh, player declares to be a warmonger Winning in wars can give you a lot of benefits, so you may want to start launching attacks to others pretty soon. To do so, you need to declare yourself as a warmonger, and then you will take this uh, token to indicate that you are a, war a warmonger. First, you take the warmonger marker and place it in front of your units. Second, you remove all of your related trading posts, including your trading posts in cities belong to your rivals or neutral cities, and also, secondly, rival trading posts in your own cities. And third, only for this turn, if uh, you do not choose to attack neutral parties, neutral cities or barbarians, you can attack each of your rivals separately. So, for example, if I declare to attack the red player, I, I would need to remove the trading post of, uh, that I have to his cities and if he had any of um, uh, trading posts on cities of my own I would also remove them. I would also gain the warmonger token and uh, start the next step for the battle, the war itself. So the third step is the attack itself. To start the war you can declare an attack targeting uh, something that is adjacent to your land or cities unless you have any across abilities. If you are a warmonger, your attack target can be a land or city of any rival, a barbarian camp or a neutral city. If you are not a warmonger yet, your attack target can be a land or city of any warmonger player or a barbarian camp. What I'm trying to say is that if, I, if I'm not a warmonger that haven't attacked any other players yet, I can attack a barbarian and still uh, it's okay and I don't uh, declare myself as a warmonger in that case. Or I can attack another player who has already declared themselves as a warmonger. But if, I'm, if I also am declared a warmonger myself, I'm able to attack any also land or city from my rivals. But the cost of that is that I take the warmonger token, which you will see has an upkeep cost of culture later on. Let's see the war. War is about calculating your total uh, combat strength, the total combat value, let's say, uh, which is depicted by this icon, uh, the icon of the, uh, the sword. Okay, and the red sword. Uh, it's uh, accumulated by values such as this. So um, the um, the one with the highest combat value wins the war. So how you calculate a player's total combat value? Uh, first of all, you roll a total of one plus the number of applicable advantages dice. That means that uh, let's say I'm the yellow player and I have advantage uh, for mountains, for uh, fields green fields and uh, grain fields, okay? And I could have all sorts of advantages if I'm attacking against uh, cities, uh, but I need to have this advantage here, or if I'm the defender, if someone is attacking me, or if I'm attacking versus mounted um, units, etc. All these are explained. But I'm rolling one die plus one more for each advantage applicable, okay? If I have advantages that are not taking part in the target, that means that none of my cities, are, uh, the target that I'm attacking towards is not on a mountain or defending, not on a grains field, not on a plains field, that means that I'm not adding additional dice, okay? I'm adding it if they're applicable based on the scenario that I'm um, attacking towards the target. But uh, as a rule I roll 1 plus the number of applicable advantages dice. Then I sum up the dice results and the combat value from the units as long as they are participating because the, in order for them to contribute their advantages they need to be participating meaning they need to be fed with resources readily available. If not neither they are participating for their combat value nor they are adding their uh, uh, advantages uh, die rolls. Okay so keep that in mind. Uh, but going back to the total calculation, the total calculation is the amount of the dice rolled. Let's say I'm fighting against uh, a, a mountain target, so I'm rolling one die plus one by default, so I'm going to roll two. So let's say I rolled zero plus four, four. Then I'm go I have my units ready available, so it's already five plus one, six. Okay, so it's six plus four. My total combat value is ten. Keep in mind that if I had match informations, I would get plus one 
okay and also there is an advantage that uh, if you're fighting a city uh, for any of the lands owned uh, around the city there is a plus one contribution to the top combat value so uh, you compare this to the respective uh, combat strength of your rival if you're attacking a land or city owned by a player uh, with ready units they also calculate their total combat value in the same format okay but keep in mind that uh, the total combat value is always zero for unready units if you're attacking a barbarian camp its combat value is always three the or uh, the brown cubes if you're attacking a neutral city the white city uh, its value is seven however if there is any trading posts in it the trading post owners may discuss and select one of them to be the protector and help the neutral city to defend the protector replaces the neutral city combat value with their own combat value just like defending their own city and in case there are no consensus reached and both of them want to be the protector the one near the attacker clockwise always is a higher priority in case that no one wants to protect the number target number of the combat strength always uh, rolls down to seven in any case after the comparison a resolution the result of the war is according to your target uh, attack uh, attack target if it's a barbarian camp you remove it and you may place a cube to occupy the hexagon as a reward if it is a neutral city with no protector you remove it and you may replace it with one of your own cities as a reward for any war amongst players you gain up to three kind of benefits based on the difference of the total combat strength between the attacking and the uh, defeated player so one plus then uh, you gain one of these tokens from the defender that's why it's, uh, the use of these tokens which are uh, going to score you victory points at the end of the game um, you skip this if uh, they have none uh, you gain uh, or if they are a protector of a neutral city you still gain one of those uh, three plus you remove the target cube or city or neutral city or you may replace it with your ores and six plus you gain one gold from the defender or protector of the neutral city and you skip that if they have none keep in mind that taking land or city in war does not activate any abilities regarding to expanding or uh, building cities okay so that's how uh, combat uh, works very simple how you calculate uh, the total combat value and based on that you will be comparing it with your uh, either uh, rival opponent or um, barbarian uh, outpost or a uh, neutral city so you can immediately immediately see and understand that there's going to be a lot of war in this game and a lot of opportunities for expanding gaining strategic resources uh, uh, gaining rewards uh, controlling uh, gaining as a reward to replace cities with your own cities and so on and so on so uh, in order to gain more victory points which is the goal of the game also keep in mind that uh, for you to attack barbarians you need to have at least a, a combat value of three and for you to attack other players and neutral cities you need to have at least a combat value of seven okay so uh, these are uh, let's say caps limits uh, to start launching attacks but you're going to gather gather this strength pretty soon because of uh, your upgraded units for sure now in your turn you also have free actions as you can see uh, anytime during your turn except in the middle of your current action or war you can perform any free action you have the option one to consume two authority uh, two authority uh, two cubes here as you can see uh, in order to convert a resource to any basic resource food production or research you may move two player cubes from your civilization board to the bottom right area of your government board and then you convert the basic resource to any other basic resource of your choice practically speaking that means i'm moving two uh, of my uh, resource cubes here don't worry i'm not going to uh, lose them forever just temporarily i'm going to get them back during the upkeep phase and then i can replace one of uh, my basic resource let's say i didn't want food i wanted production with another basic resource okay so that's how it works as long as you have cubes from here to put them there that's the first option and you can do this as much as you want that's the first option the second option in addition is to unlock one of the four abilities of your civilization board remember here we have two gray um, abilities the two gray cubes uh, each civilization has a set of four unique abilities one two three four linked to their specific civilization based on their characteristics you can unlock up to two that's why you have two gray cubes and then by covering the square with the ability cube you cannot unlock the same ability twice if there is any resources requirement you must pay it in order to unlock it and the roman number on the right shows in which epoch the ability becomes available 
for example. In Greece, all of those are available for from Epoch 1, but if it said Epoch 2 or Epoch 3 here, you need to wait until Epoch 2 or 3 respectively to upgrade them. Uh, if it has a cost, like in this one, Phylax has a food cost, you need to pay one food in order to place it here and have the ability uh, unlocked. In this case, you gain the Phalanx card and you gain two authority also cubes. If it doesn't have a cost, like for example, Platonic Academy, uh, you don't have to pay anything and you gain the ability. And different civilizations, based on their characteristics, have different abilities. In any case, after your uh, military step, your turn ends and the player to your left starts your turn. Players take turns until all players have done six turns in an epoch and then the epoch itself ends. End of an epoch. When the epoch has ended, we resolve the following steps as shown here. So, uh, first we gain great work of art. Art usually comes uh, from literate people. Only the civilization with higher culture can produce art. You determine which player can get an art token by the table uh, listed here. So based on the epoch, one, two or three, and based on the number of players, two, three or four, um, the first player, for example, in uh, fa first epoch, the ones with the most culture, gains uh, one uh, great work of art token. Okay, In a three player, the top two, and in a four player, the top three. And this changes based on the epoch and the number of players. You want to collect those because they will give you victory points at the end of the game. Uh, works of art should be kept at the bottom right of your government board. There is a space there, so you can fold, uh, keep them there. And you always have to show the number of uh, uh, work, great works of art that you have collected to the other players. So, so this is a public information. Then you gain trading income. Let's see how this works. Each player gains uh, their trade income based on the trading board. You compare your uh, supply and demand markers and gain the reward under the lower one. For example, in this case, my supply is at 5 and my uh, demand is at 8. So I'm only going to focus on this column, which means the lowest one is my supply at 5. So I'm going to gain 3 gold and 2 culture. After this step, everybody is doing it simultaneously, we move to the food consumption. As you see here, players need to uh, do checks and feed uh, their people. Each player checks the number of city they have on the map and they spend an amount of food for each based on the table shown here on the player aid. If you have enough food to feed all of your cities, you will be rewarded per each city you have. However, if you do not have enough, you need to remove cities until you have enough food for all remaining cities on the map. For each city you removed, your culture will be decreased because of the grumble of your starving people. And this is of course linked with this table here. So for example, uh, in Epoch 3 I need to pay 3 food for each of my cities. Okay? In Epoch 2 I need to pay 2 food for each of my cities. And here is the rewards and here is the uh, consequence if you remove uh, due to unfed uh, situation cities from your board due to famine and you lose uh, culture for each. So uh, once this step is done, the food consumption, then we move to step number four with a gold conversion. We, conver we convert all of our basic resources, food, production and research, to one gold. Okay, so uh, we need to convert for any three combinations, so any three they will give us one gold. So if I have three food, I will get one gold. If I have one of each, I will get one gold. If your government form is monarchy, instead of three, uh, you convert two basic resources to one gold. Then you return all remaining basic resources back to their piles. In other words, only gold can be kept to the next epoch. Keep in mind that only if you have any abilities that allow you to keep some kind of basic resources to the next epoch, for example, uh, the invention of food preservation, can allow you to not convert them to gold by choice. The next step, step number five, is uh, the barbarians uh, pillaging. If there are any barbarian camps, brown cubes, adjacent to your uh, land or city, you will lose one gold for each. Then number six step is restore command the consumed uh, command uh, authority. So if you have any consumed uh, cubes to convert them to resources uh, from the free actions within the epoch, you return them to your civilization board. They're uh, again available. And the last step 
is uh, the warmonger, as you can see here, the ones who have declared themselves warmonger and have the warmonger uh, token. Uh, being warmonger is an uncivilized act, so these players with this uh, warmonger token will uh, have uh, culture decreased. If you are a warmonger, you return the warmonger market to the supply. Then you decrease one, two, or three cultures depending on which epoch you are in. Okay, but the good thing is that you return it to the supply, so you can again be declared warmonger on the next epoch. So once this is done. Uh, we set up the next epoch, and this is done only on epochs 1 and 2, and let's see what that means. So first we discard the old epoch market cards that are not yet into the market, if any. Then uh, we set up basic units of the new epoch, so the ones of epoch 1 will be removed and uh, the ones of epoch 2 will be uh, placed there. Uh, in each epoch there are one main unit and one support unit that are always available for upgrade in the market. When starting a new epoch you discard the old ones and you replace with the new ones. The third step is that you create the market deck for the new epoch. You take uh, the market of the new epochs. So we start with one, so we're going to take the one from epoch two. Uh, shuffle it and place it face down, face down on the drawing board. When setting up for epoch three, we'll shuffle together epoch three and epoch three plus market cards uh, separately. And we place 14 of epoch three market cards on top of the uh, three plus market cards and place them face down to create the total uh, drawing uh, pile. Then uh, we set up Invention uh, Market, we discard all the unfinished Epoch Invention cards on the Invention Market board, I have removed it now from the screen, but uh, it's the blue board that I've shown you at the starting of the start of the video. Then we draw four uh, Invention cards from the new Epoch, and we set them on the market, and then return the rest of the new Epoch Invention deck back to the game, they're not going to be used for the rest of the game. Step number five, only for Epoch 2, we set up Epoch 3 Invention uh, Drawing Deck, and we shuffle all the Epoch 3 Invention card decks uh, and place them uh, here. And then we start with a new Epoch. The player on the left of the previous first player becomes the first player of the new Epoch. And then we continue with the new Epoch. So that's how the change of the Epoch occurs. End of the game and final scoring. After the end of Epoch 3, the game ends. It is time to calculate the total victory points to see who is the greatest leader in the reimagination of history. So we have the scoring pad, so we can uh, uh, use it uh, to uh, take all the uh, scoring uh, respectively. So first of all, players gain one victory point for each culture they have, meaning if they reach, I don't know, 20 culture, they will be transformed into 20 victory points. Then uh, each um, of the uh, lands that you own give you one victory point. It, where you have an authority uh, cube. Each of your cities awards you four victory points. Each of uh, two gold give you one victory point. You also check to see if you have any end of game uh, abilities from uh, monuments typically, uh, wonders, etc. You also gain one victory point for any of those tokens earned from wars against other players. And the last thing is that you earn victory points for the total number of great uh, work of art that you have based on this table, meaning if you have one, you're going to get one victory point. If you manage to get, I don't know, six, you're going to get 17 points. If you have seven or more, you're going to get 22 victory points. You summarize, uh, you sum all the total value of victory points collected and uh, the one with the most victory points is the greatest leader winning the game. If there is a tie, the player with the highest culture is the winner. And remember, if you are uh, in the same value of culture with one player, the one who is ahead is considered to be uh, ahead uh, because they reached the culture first. So there you have it. This is everything you need to know about epochs, scores of cultures, and this is how the game plays. So there you have it. This is everything you need to know about how to play the game. Uh, I have no inside information, but I'm guessing there's going to be also more things unlocked on the campaign uh, page. Uh, even in the rulebook they mention that in the core game the, you don't have any battles on sea hexes. Uh, so if they say that, I expect that there's going to be some kind of uh, at least expansion or unlock or something for uh, sea battle and sea expansion and so on, among other things. Let's see, let's explore together what they're going to reveal during the crowdfunding campaign page, which is uh, starting soon. Add 
I'm going to add the link in the description of the video as I said before. But let's focus on what I really enjoyed about the game. Okay, so I really like Civ games. I enjoy games like uh, a class of cultures, which is a fantastic uh, civilization game through the ages, uh, uh, space civilization games from, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Eclipse, uh, from Twilight Imperium, from uh, uh, a lot of games that have this uh, Civ game and they, uh, they, they really put it in the forward. Okay, uh, class of culture is the one that comes on top of my mind uh, through the ages. This game, I think it's going to be loved by a lot of fans of this genre, of the Civ game genre. And why is that? Because it really, really has a very great flow. You really feel that you start from, I don't know, stones and fire and basic stuff and basic crafting. And through the epochs and with your course of your actions, you're shaping your civilization, you're making it different, you invent things, you do research, you take culture, which is points, you expand, you make production, you make beautiful inventions, which really give you the edge, both from abilities, from end game scoring opportunities, uh, from expanding your, upgrading your military uh, units. Even if you're not want to go into uh, battling and uh, war, it, the game really, really uh, makes you want to at least uh, attack the neutral, you know, the barbarians, so that you can expand, having uh, control of specific regions or specific uh, resources, strategic resources is important for upgrading even more. And the game really offers a lot of paths. And we've seen that in other games. So, so far I shouldn't theoretically be so excited about the game because this uh, sounds like a recipe already done. But there is something which is really, really different in this game. And I think uh, it's the ease of access. Don't get me wrong, this is not a light civ game, it's a medium civilization game with a lot of meat around the bone, with a lot of options, fantastic um, opportunities to parameterize yourself, to become different, to try different things, to go for different things, to uh, explore different aspects of inventions, of abilities, of cultures, of civilizations, and so on. So this game has all of that. But what this game does, I think, successfully, in my opinion, and really, really successfully, is making it... Uh, making it click right, I don't know how can to explain it uh, better, it's what I would have wanted from a streamlined, robust, hefty, uh, you know, uh, rich civilization game without any downsides, like too many details, uh, rules that are easily forgotten, everything feels natural. If you've played other civilization games, this will feel natural to you. It's what you would expect. The core game design on your turn is that you do either two actions or one action and one invention invention and this is important because you want to you have to make three inventions per um, per era so some of your round turns are going to be just invent and action others are going to be action and action so you can do you know uh, uh, attacking other players changing government feels right because the government is really thematic it's linked with the amount of cities you have the production you have the opportunities you have so culture is important because it's victory points select uh, you know expanding and making war is may important in some cases you know to gain uh, victory points expanding and building cities is important because it gives you victory points but overall the game delivers a very very thematic experience for the civilization genre a very robust uh, gameplay style uh, very easy to understand and get behind if you have played other civilization games you're definitely going to get this very very fast you're going to be able to remember things easily you're going to be able to put it on the table easy okay it takes around three hours so that's that's fine so any decent civilization game should take around that if not more so that's fine i don't have any complaint with the time uh, that i spent with the game it's exactly it it kept me uh, you know doing things thinking things and uh, being involved in the game so it plays very well with two it plays very well with three and four also so it scales nice with uh, the map size and the different uh, size of the board so overall great choice uh it, it really scales very very nice it really offers a lot it's very different but also i don't know very uh, very expected in terms of what i would have wanted a civ game to to have and include uh, the battle and the, the you know the advantage is fantastic that's another plus of the game very straightforward battle very easy to to set you know fast round so it really makes war easy and uh, battles easy the advantage is a fantastic opportunity because you want to have your your uh, units fed so they're ready makes sense but you also want to have them uh, having a, a variety of advantages because they may have additional dice to roll uh, depending on the two units you have you know you have a, sub a main and a supply so you can you don't have one million different units you just need to upgrade them uh, uh, through the epochs uh, to better versions of units okay they give you advantages on different terrain they give you advantages for different 
uh, if you're defending, if you're fighting mounted or unmounted units, if you're fighting cities, etc. So overall, very, very robust, very, very, uh, I would say, interesting very different and very very expected also in a good way not uh, not expected that i'm uh, i'm seeing more of the same i'm seeing what i would have wanted classical typical civilization games to have in their design without any rough edges you know uh, again rules that are easily forgotten million things to remember even from session to session where you play so many games and then you want to pick up one game after one month I'm telling you, you're going to remember 90% of the things because it just makes sense and they're logical, but they're also innovative and very, very interesting and uh, offer a very nice gaming experience. So there you have it. This is my final thoughts about the game. Definitely check it out. If you're a fan of uh, Civilization games, you, you'll be missing if you, if you don't. It's highly recommended from my side and it, it's easily going to climb up high on the uh, you know on the favorite list of a lot of uh, Civilization fan uh, gamers among there. Another, you know, last thing to close is that I think this is a civilization game that even non-experienced civilization gamers, which have played medium games, can easily get behind. So it's a fantastic opportunity for a first experience of, with a civilization game. If anyone has an experienced civilization game or want to bring new gamers to the civ genre, but also it's very satisfying to experience one. So let's uh, let's close with that. So many thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video, and let's see what the campaign is going to unlock for them. <music>